Hey, it's me. How are you folks? On this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour, we are joined by Jimmy Bowen. Jimmy Bowen is a record producer whose work has made a very lasting impression on music today. Formerly a recording artist himself, he's produced for the likes of Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. In the 1970s, he headed for Music City, that's Nashville. He produced the best of the best. We're talking George Strait, Reba McIntyre, Kenny Rogers, Jimmy Buffett. The list goes on and on, but he's a great storyteller, and it's with great pleasure I say these words. Welcome, Jimmy Bowen. Good morning. Thank you, Paul. So how are you today? Absolutely. I live up in uh, in Colorado. The sun's shining. The snow's gone. It's a wonderful day. <laughs> so I think most stories are best from the beginning. Tell us about some of your earliest musical memories. Well, somewhere, I think as our junior year in high school, I was given a ukulele as a gift, and my best friend went uh, a guitar store had an opening he won a guitar and that started our careers my ukulele was kept being drowned out by his guitar so i got a guitar and then he got electric guitar so i had to get electric guitar and we started playing and we there was this high school assembly we went and we they asked us to sing a couple songs and the reaction from girls was the absolute proof we should get in that business uh, that did it. We said, "Oh, this is wonderful!" And uh, we went to college. We ran into a guy named Buddy Knox uh, at college, and the, the three of us, this, uh, Don Lanier, I grew up with, and Buddy Knox and I, we became a campus trio and did uh, parties and so forth. And uh, Roy Orbison came to the school to do a show, and I'd never heard of him. No one had at the time. Uh, I went backstage, and this man started to sing, and I couldn't believe how great he was. So I said to his guitar player, where did he record this Oopie Doopie song we're hearing? They said, Clovis, New Mexico, which was an hour and a half from where we lived. So uh, we went to Clovis, and we recorded and we did Party Doll that we had written. Buddy was Buddy today would be a country singer. Back then, we thought we were rock and roll. In fact, somebody called us in New York rockabillies, and we were highly insulted. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> today they were right on, of course. Uh, so we nobody wanted. To, I, I, I we had to have a B side for Party Doll, so they had me sing a song we called, well, called "I'm Sticking with You." So that became our record. We sent it off to four or five labels that existed back then, and uh, only Dot responded. Dot Records said the party that all was too risque. We learned later if you're too risque, you probably got a hit, but we didn't know it then. So we put it out on our own label, uh, some up in Panama, Texas. Some young lady took it to Dallas, gave it to a top 40 disc jockey. He started playing it. You know, music's that way, it's kind of like a spire, it grows. And I'm in a radio station working at K Triple D in Dumas, Texas. And the girl buzzes me one day and says, "There's a Morris Levy on the phone from you for you from New York." So I took the call. It was great because on the other end I hear, "Hey kid, we like that record you got. I want you to come to New York. We want to buy it. We want to make a deal with you." And I said, "To New York, honey." He said, "I'll send you a thousand dollars. You guys come up here. We'll make a deal." He sent a wire. It took me all day to get it cashed in Dumas, Texas, for a thousand dollars. We fly to New York City. We get there on a Friday. We're meeting with Morris Levy's publishing guy, Phil Call, and I'm the negotiator for the group. And I didn't know what I was negotiating about, but we negotiated for a couple hours. They wanted to buy the master. They wanted the publishing. And this guy Morris Levy walks in and he says, "Hey kid, nice to meet you." He peeled off. Ten one hundred dollar bills. He said, "Here, you kids have a great weekend. We'll finish this Monday." And he left, and the other guy left, and we looked at each other and said, "Well, let's go spend it." <laughs> so, the, the problem: well, we went to the Latin Quarter, we went to Birdland, that club that he owned. 
it was great and wonderful. But Monday, we probably had about $80, $90 on the bath. So we had to make a deal. It was quite clever on his part, I thought. Uh, and now we're in the music business. So he, they start Roulette Records. They put Party Doll out, Buddy Knox, and they they call us the Rhythm Orchids because they were, they were into R&B music. I guess that's where that came from. And then I'm Sticking With You by Jimmy Bowen in the Rhythm Orchid. And we went back to Texas, and the, the records came in the mail. They said, here, we split this up, and uh, we're going to have two big hits. And we were in the record business. And that was in uh, early, we did it in 56. That was early 1957. Our first show was at the Paramount Theater, Times Square, New York. And Alan Freed uh, uh, might have been an Easter show or uh, some show when the kids were out. Times Square was packed. We were in a little hotel. We came out of the hotel and nobody knew us thing about and just walked through all these thousands of kids to get to the backstage and go into the theater uh, to work. Uh, we went out for lunch the first day and got slammed up against the wall. Those kids were looking for souvenirs. They, they had scissors, pens and paper. They wanted something. Hmm. So we stayed like, we, we never left the damn uh, theater anymore until late at night. We'd be, you'd do six, seven shows a day back then. And there was some great talent on the show. Frankie Lyman, the teenagers, and just some real good. We were, uh, we, that was a, we started at the top and kind of worked our way down. Uh, so that whole thing lasted for us uh, for about till like the end of '59. Uh, uh, Buddy and I split up. I had I worked uh, with a band, and Buddy uh, worked with the band. And I was out in Wyoming, and uh, I called this friend of mine at Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I said, "Hey." I said, Ken, I think I'm going to have to quit doing this. He said, what's the problem? I said, there's more of us on stage than there are in the audience. <laughs> I'm not very smart, but I know that's not a good sign. So he owned KYS, KYSN in Colorado Springs. I go back there. I went down for about seven, eight, nine months. He gave me a 10 to 1 shift trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I decided that was, wasn't it. Uh, so I went to California. And I wind up working for American Music in California. Glenn Campbell joined them about two weeks before I did. And we're writing for them. And he and I started doing all the demos for all the songwriters. If Glenn heard a song once, he could do it. That was the most, he had the most gifted voice of anybody I ever worked with. And, and an incredible talent and didn't really know the music, uh, which made us really good because neither did I, really. Uh, and we started doing the demo sessions in a little studio called Gold Star out in Hollywood. And across the hall, this guy named Phil Spector was in there doing music. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was so good. And we became friends, and he let me listen to what he was doing. And that's when I decided, I see, <laughs> that's what I want to do. I want to produce. Now, we were totally opposite. Phil Spector, when he produced, it was a Phil Spector record. Uh, who sang it was the material he put people on once he had the basic track done, except for the Righteous Brothers. And some stuff he did later, of course, with the, uh, Harrison and them. But I, just the way he did it knocked me out. And uh, so uh, that's, what I want, that's what I wanted to do. And I started trying to find a way to do that. And I had a, uh, I got a job to run Chancellor Records in L.A., the West Coast, for Chancellor Records out of Philly. Chancellor had Frankie Avalon, and I'd worked with Frankie when we were on the road in the, in the 50s doing those tours. And they had Fabian, they had Gloria Gaynor, had a big hit record. But at least I was in the record business. And uh, a man named Murray Wolf used to come play songs for me for a New York publisher, and one, he, uh, he'd take me to Dodger baseball games, nice dinners, uh, because most of the people wouldn't see him. They were young people. And uh, uh, I had no idea. I, I figured his, his expense money from this publishing company must have been pretty good because we had great seats and stuff, great reservations. One day he said to me, Sinatra, uh, it, 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 who, who owned Reprise Records at the time, had started it a couple of years before. He decided to hire somebody young. He didn't like rock and roll, but he decided he was losing money, maybe better 
uh, get some youth in there. And he said to me, would you be interested? I, of course, said, I sure would. A couple of weeks later, I had this little one-room apartment out in Hollywood. Everything came out of the wall except the bathroom, you know, the table and the bed and stuff. <laughs> and the phone rang, and, and he said, he's whispered to me, he said, you got the job. And then he said out loud, oh, hold on, Frank wants to talk to you. I'm told on the phone, Sinatra came on the line, he said, James, glad to have you aboard. Click. <laughs> well, I can work for a man like that, you know. So, uh, so I go down Monday and I meet Mo Austin, who's uh, just come over from Verve Records to be the uh, the head of Reprise, and uh, I was in the record business. This must have been very, very exciting. All of this. <laughs> it was, yes, it, it it all was. It, it, Looking back on it, it happens sometimes so quickly, and the changes would be so quick, you didn't even know it until you were doing it, you know. I was at, at, at Reprise a couple months, and the head of a r left. I think he irritated Frank, and they ran him off. And so I was it. So Mo just decided to leave it that way for a while, let me be the a r person. And I went through the roster of the whole company, and, and Frank had signed Phil Harris, Alice Fay, uh, several piano players you never heard of. Guitar. It was his label. You know, he'd go in a bar somewhere and hear a piano player like him. He, he could sign him. <laughs> and his old friends, he had signed them. But I looked at the list, and I, I went to Mo one day, and I said, Mo, there's 100 people here. 92 of them can't sell records, never will in this market. Uh, this baby's going under. <laughs> he can't, it, it doesn't work. And he said, yeah, well, you know, these, some of these are Frank's friends, some people Frank signed, you know, and uh, no one wants to tell him that, you know, it's just labeling, do what he wants. I said, well, leave it like this, it's going under, I'll tell him. I'll explain it to him. So Mo sent me to Palm Springs and a limo to go tell Sinatra that I, that I had to reduce the roster. <laughs> you know, you're young, you're dumb. I, was, I didn't think about it him not caring for that, you know? So I go down there to uh, a guy named George who worked for Frank, a real sweet guy. He lets me in. Frank had a bar in the living room, big, beautiful bar. And I'm sitting at the bar. And in a couple of minutes, Frank comes out of the bedroom. James, how are you? Yeah, that's the first time we'd ever met. Yeah, it's good to see you. And um, he said, uh, would you like a drink? And I said, do you have any Jack Daniels? He, he, his eyes lit up. He said, give us each one. So I get a little shot of Jack Daniels. He gets one. I had never tasted Jack Daniels. I just knew he drank it. <laughs> so I tried to be cool, you know. So he said, took a little sip. And I took a little sip. And man, it was like gasoline. <laughs> well, <clears throat> he said, what do you want to see me about? And I said, well, uh, you got too many people on the roster. I need to reduce the roster down to those who can sell records. If we don't do it, Frank, this company can't last another year because it's overloaded. People cannot sell records. I made it pretty quick and concise. He took another sip at Jack Daniels, down the rest of the shot, set it down. He said, well, then take care of it. Shook my hand, went back in the bedroom. I said, damn. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I took my shot now. I threw it down. I almost passed out. That was the hardest drinking stuff I'd ever had in my life. So I go back to the car. And I get in the limo. We're heading back to California. And I'm going, oh, damn. Now i got to get rid of 80 some odd people. Uh, that took about two months. And, you know, I'd call him and explain, listen, hey, you know, Frank, Frank's your friend. But if I don't do this, his label's going to go under and the only one that didn't act very pleased about it all was uh, Clint Eastwood. I had to do it by phone. He was doing a spaghetti western in Italy. And I had to tell him by phone. I don't think he was pleased at all. But <laughs> but most of the people understood. The only one I didn't drop that I was going to drop was a guy named Soupy Sales. He had a TV show uh, during the day, kind of a crazy show. I, I, I'd only seen it. Uh, at the time, I hadn't seen it at all. And when he came in, I heard somebody dancing out in the hall and singing. And the girl buzzed and said, it's super sales. I said, Sandy, man, he came, he came in and did about a two-minute song. This is kind of stuff he did on his TV show. 
And then he comes in a pirouette and sit down in the chair. What do you want to see me about? <laughs> I said, well, I, I was going to do this whole story, but I had to, had to let you go because I have to reduce the roster. But after that interest, I'm not going to let you go. <laughs> but sure is nice to meet you. Let's talk about what you're going to do. And he left. So it was two or three months of that kind, but who I wanted to do in that roster, I wanted to produce Dean Martin. Now, a guy named Jack Nietzsche and I had become friends in L.A. I, through Phil Spector. He did uh, it. was the arranger that worked with Phil on all his stuff. So I did, we did a thing, an album with, with Jack called uh, Lonely Surfer. And it was a hit wherever there was an ocean, which isn't didn't cover a lot of states in this in our country so it was kind of like a number 70 80 record but i wanted to do dean martin that's the one i would you get a feeling sometimes that's somebody i can really really help i can help them get back uh, into this era of music uh, so i went to to his manager and i told him i said i'm telling you something i can help him have hits he, he, a lot of stuff is right for it. It's just a matter of material and approach. So finally, and he told Dean, Dean said, well, let's give the kid a chance. Uh, so that's how I got to work with Dean. Uh, I had the first album. I wanted, I wanted to meet with him by an album, a current album. And he had just come out of Vegas. And after his show, he went in the lounge with a trio and did a lot of old standards. And of course, the women, you know, just falling out of their chairs. And Dean, and so his manager came back and said, listen, he wants to do this album of mood songs first, then whatever you want. So I said, well, obviously I didn't have any choice, uh, but fine. So I get musicians together, go in the studio, and Ken Lane, his, his piano player, who was with him for years and years, he was the little white-haired guy on the TV show that played the piano. And, and some other rhythm players, and we're doing these old standards. It's pretty easy to do. And he, Dean, I, the 12th one he threw out, threw out I don't want to do that. Uh, I said, we need one more song. And Ken peeked over the piano and said, Dean, uh, how about the song, my song? So Dean and I walk over to the piano. Ken starts playing, everybody loves somebody sometime. Ba-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I went, holy shit. That's marvelous. I thought it was a brand new song. So they work, they work it up in this mood arrangement. And I go back in the control room, and all the Dean's buddies are a bunch of people are in there. And I said to the engineer, my God, the song they're running down. I said, this is the record. This is the song for him now. It's a, it's a great new song. And so they all started laughing. They said, no, it was 20, 25 years old. I didn't know it. So on the way out, we finished on the way out. I, I, I walked over to Dean. I said, Dean, that's that's the that's a hit. That's a hit for you. He said, Well, uh, uh, let's do it. So I worked it out the next week, and we went in and recorded everybody loves somebody, and that was the start of my career. Uh, so successful, it was it turned out to be one of those worldwide kind of hits. And when he first came to the session to do that one, I had a forty-piece orchestra. But what I did with him, I kept the strings and voices and stuff that he'd been associated with his sound, but I brought in the modern rhythm section. These are the kids that became the wrecking crew, known as the wrecking crew later out there in California. And so it was a modern rhythm section with the big orchestra. It took me two and a half hours to get it right in the studio. The sound, right? We didn't have multi-track back then. We had three tracks. You didn't have a lot of microphone inputs. We to get it right, it took some time. And I, I kept walking by him. <laughs> He's just sitting on the chair watching. And I walked by and I said, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Take your time. He said, take your time. What, the last time I said, I'm almost ready. He, he said, take your time. I'm enjoying. I've never recorded with lead drums before. <laughs> he was sitting about 30 feet from Hal Blaine, this great drummer. <laughs> and it was all one big room. Everybody's out in the open pretty much. And he just, he just never... Uh, been involved in it. Well, I get it right. He walks back second time he sings it. He, he, he didn't have to do takes for many takes. And uh, second time we had it, and uh, that started the whole the whole thing. 
was I kind of uh, became Frank Buck, bring them back alive for about three or four years because <laughs> it kept taking acts that shouldn't be in the market where it was, but finding a way to make it work, you know. So what is it about a song that makes you decide on it? Like that song, I mean, everybody knows that song and you were absolutely correct. Everyone identifies with it. But what is it about a song that gets you going? You know, I I don't know there's an answer to that. Each one of us who made a living doing, knowing what was a good song and a bad song, it really, there were different factors. First of all, the song itself, melody and message, had to work for the time you're living. Being young at the time, you're more aware than if you're uh, somebody's been around 30 years. Those artists had no idea what song we write for them in that marketplace. But, but like when you hear everybody loves somebody and you look at Dean, it fit his voice perfectly. The message, there's, there's a song in country now that reminds me of it in message. And that's, uh, I believe, I think it's, uh, uh, I believe most people are good. Uh, it's, it's a, they did it, the, the, the Big, tall, good-looking kid, a country kid, did it the other night on the ACM. Uh, you hear that song. He was there, all those people. Uh, he's singing, I believe most people are good. Uh, everybody loves somebody. There are certain song, uh, thoughts properly put to music that just, you know, you just know. And rarely are you wrong about those. Uh, but because the, the, the theme is... is uh, so used by everybody and trying to always do that in songs like love and people are the positive kind of stuff. The combo has to be there. The artist for the song, that same song with some other artists might not work. It's a marriage of song to artist that was uh, uh, so important. And you find that out as, as you, as you learn your, 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 your craft by being wrong as many as times as being right. We're talking with record producer Jimmy Bowen. I want you to tell us your recollections of the album The World We Knew that Frank Sinatra was the artist on. What are your memories from that time? Well, that's a, uh, the, uh, the World We Knew was a Burt Kemper song. And we had had huge success with uh, Strangers in the Night. That was uh, a, a, a song that that uh, that I, I, I did with Sinatra and been a big, big hit. When I took uh, The World We Knew to Frank, The World We Knew is a hard song to sing. It's rangy. And I took it over and played it for Frank. And he's listening to it and all. And then he starts go to piano and he's kind of running through it. He looked at me and he said, is Kemper trying to make a song I can't sing? <laughs> <laughs> it's the hardest song. I mean, if you listen to that song, it's, it's a rangy and it goes everywhere. And what, so, but he decided to do it, but he had to be in New York at the time and scheduling wise, I needed to do it. So we did it in New York and he hadn't recorded there in 25 or 30 years. It was a big thing. I had no idea. I had I really had to rent two stu recording studios across the hall from each other. I had to put the crowd in one studio with visual and audio, and uh, the musicians in the other because I had a huge orchestra. And then the control room, I had ha I had to have security to keep people where they belonged because he was back in New York and people. And it wasn't like people off the street. It was Bennett Serp and it was all these names I'd heard of all my life or you'd know at the time and they, they came to see Frank record and it was a tough song to do and we got the basic of it there but I didn't like the the rhythm section just didn't do it for me couldn't could, couldn't get it right so I took it back to California to put the uh, the wrecking crew rhythm section I put the I replaced it first time I'd ever tried to do that in the last <laughs> You can replace strings and singers and horns, but replacing the rhythm section is a task. It took about four hours uh, before we finally got that uh, replaced. I always thought it was uh, 
a marvelous thing, the way Frank handled that melody and that range of that song. It wasn't as big a hit as Strangers in the Night or That's Life, but it was a neat musical thing. Another song that you produced, probably one of the most famous duets that Sinatra did with his daughter, Nancy Sinatra, Something Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> All the anytime you work with Martins or Sinatras, it oftentimes can be uh, very different than most recording sessions. But Nancy found something, the song something stupid, and uh, I had I had hired Lee Hazelwood to produce Nancy. I was the head of A&R Reprise, and I didn't I just didn't know how to help. Her her vocally and Lee Hazelwood came to me and said, yes, I, I know exactly how to record her. And he did, turns out. And uh, she found the song. So I, I'm Frank's producer, Lee's Nancy's producer. So we, Billy Strange was the arranger that we brought in who Billy I'd worked with and Billy did Nancy stuff. And we booked the studio and went in to do something stupid. When we get there, Frank walks in with Mia Farrell. She sits down on the couch in the normal group of entourage. And uh, the uh, Mo Austin's there, all the people in the company. And we do the first serious take on it. And we take a break. People are listening. And Mo came to me and said, isn't that a little odd? The, mother, the father-daughter for that lyric you know, which is a, a love, a loving lyric. And I looked at Mo and laughed and I said, you want to tell him of me? <laughs> it goes back years before. <laughs> Mo said, uh, I ain't going to tell him to drop those artists. I said, I will. So I said, you're going to tell him of me. And we had a good laugh, not that we didn't tell each other. Uh, so we did it one more time and we had to, we had to take it all. And now, it's time to mix it down between Frank and Nancy. And so I said, listen, I've got a meeting I got to go to. Lee, you you and uh, we had Eddie Brackett was a great engineer. I said, you and Eddie mix, go ahead and start this and I'll come back in about an hour, hour or two. So <laughs> I did it on purpose. I wanted, I wanted him to be the one to do the ba mix balance on Frank and Nancy because it had to be lead Frank. It had to be strong. He had to be the strongest uh, but of the two and sure enough uh, Nancy's mother a bunch of people said Nancy's not loud enough not loud enough I said you gotta talk to that damn Lee Hazelwood <laughs> <laughs> he's the one he's the one who mixed it uh, but uh, that's how that, that that thing came about and of course that worked awful good too and you went on to produce an album for Nancy Sinatra what did you find her to be like well, I didn't produce an album on her, but Lee did. Lee did a couple. Of, Lee has uh, "Boots Made Made for Walking" was a big hit for for Nancy, and several several things after that. And they sold a, they sold a lot of albums. Nancy, what I was doing was taking the older acts and trying to bring them into the young world. Nancy was not older; she was young, and Hazelwood, well, he he himself was not that young, but he. That's what his music was. He was just he knew, he knew, knew exactly what songs and what music to, to put around her. To me, I would never have thought of that, but but he did. A lot of times when you're head of A and R, there's people you should do and people you shouldn't do yourself. But your job is to find uh, to find the artist help. But production is production is there's two ways to produce records. Phil Spector's way, where it's his music, his record, and somebody singing on it. Or the way I did uh, was you help an artist do their music, and you must always make it their music. Therefore, you can help uh, dozens of artists, and it won't all sound the same. It'll it'll still be their stuff. And Lee did that great with Nancy. And so with that in mind, what approach did you take when you were working with Sammy Davis Jr.? Well, first, working with Sammy was a bit insane. Uh, you, you, it's like a movie with a, a star and an entourage. 
That was incredible. Sammy's on stage from Hank from age four. Sammy didn't have a child. The show business was his own, his whole world. So even when I'm working with him and he's probably 40 years old, 41, he's still very young, like and vibrant and, <laughs> and, and spread all out in everything that he, that he does. And, uh, I remember going to Chicago to have a meeting with him once and I walked through the foyer to get back to where he was. And there was about 10, 12 black guys sitting in the room, very sullen room. And I'm the only white guy in the whole place walking through with, with, with these, with these people. And Sammy, when I come in, always give me a big hug. How are you? That is a loving guy. And I turned around and said, I wasn't sure I was going to get through that opening area out there and he laughed he laughed he said Bowen I spent I spent 40 years uh, trying to be white and now black is beautiful and that was Sammy Davis he was living he lived he was, his world was so different than anything I'd ever been around it was very difficult to help him because he was always on the go he's like trying to catch a kid to tell him something he, he had a Broadway thing and this thing Mac Davis was a friend of mine. He wrote a song called In the Ghetto. I, I sent Mac and his publisher up to uh, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, where uh, Sammy was working, to play him this song. It was bad casting on my part, but I, I just I was trying to find a hit for Sammy, and I loved that song. But Mac called me back. He said, Bowen, uh, I've been up here now for two hours. I've, I've sung my song about 30 times. He said, uh, when he got there, in that period of time, wherever Sammy was, it was usually his entourage and visiting entourage. Uh, and uh, these were all people who grew up in the ghetto and stuff. And he started singing in the ghetto. And they'd make, I'll do it again, do it again. The next morning, Jesse Jackson was there. At 8.30 in the morning, Jesse woke Mac up, said, Mac, I'm sorry, I got to go to the airport. Please, I got to hear that song one more time. That song to, to someone who had lived it, it was so, so important. Sammy didn't even quite really learn the song. That's not where his head was. That's not, it didn't hit him the same way. He could see it and relate to it, but he showed up at the session. Jesse Jackson wanted to kill him. He just hadn't learned the song very well, and it didn't come off. On the other hand, when I went to him with a meeting and I said, Sammy, here's the, the, the this, I got the song, here's the song. Uh, it is called I Gotta Be Me. It was from a Broadway show. He turned me over on his desk and pulled it over and said, somebody sent this to me too. I agree, I like it. Well, now we had some, he liked it, it, it fit him. And uh, as unusual as all that is, we, we got to the studio and I brought an arranger in from New York, real talented guy. He did that, uh, Mac the Knife and stuff for Bobby Darren before. And Paul, I'm sorry, but I, I've lost that name at the moment. But uh, he came in, did an arrangement, and I, I, I uh, had that rhythm section that I like so much in California. And that song came off, and that was a big hit for Sam. And that's the only b uh, big hit that I that I was able to find the right marriage of Sam, of song and Sammy. I'm just curious because so much of what a great album is, is great songs sung by a great singer. So I would like to know what kind of relationship and what do you think, what does Jimmy Bowen think of songwriters? How important well, are songwriters? <sighs> Well, the most important ingredient, you you have nothing without the song. Everybody could just sing their version of the national anthem. It's the whole, the song, the songwriter. Uh, it's really neat that in the last 20 years, they're starting to be compensated a lot better than at times in the past. Uh, but the song is is just the, the thing I loved about Nashville, Paul. Nashville, there must have been 5,000 songwriters in Nashville, waiting tables, <laughs> probably doing Uber now, you know. And then a hundred of them, that there was always this great world of song in Nashville because it, it, they'd hung with each other, they fed off of each other. 
and uh, without the song, without the piano player writing everybody loves somebody. Look what that one song did for Dean, for Warner Apries Records, for myself. The song is the whole key. Well, on the note of Nashville, what was it that got you thinking that that's where you needed to be? It was a, a life at the time. I was in, in the 60s, 64, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Right in there, we had lots of hits, and so millions and millions of albums. But the, but the, what I, the artist that I was able to, that I was helping do these really good records was the exception to the times and the marketplace, the Beatles, the Stones, all the other stuff that were, that was really the right age match for the people buying the records. And was I knew that that was going to be a, a, a small window that can't last. You can't, you can't, you don't change music. You don't change the times. You fit yourself in sometimes. So it's like, what am I going to do now? Come 68, 69, I, I, I ran MGM Records in LA for like a year and a half, around seventy, seventy-one, and produced <laughs> producing some producing records and stuff for people. And it's like, okay, now I got to the point in the early seventies where you better decide what you're going to do. Didn't like to do groups. Uh, I had one meeting with the Grateful Dead at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles, and. Uh, this this joint kept coming around. I'd never smoked any grass. We, I learned to drink Jack Daniels, unfortunately. <laughs> and as I as, so as they, as they passed the joint to fit in, as it came by, I noticed how they did. I just squeezed it real tight and passed it on. Act like I did it. Well, as the meeting went on, my grip loosened, <laughs> and pretty soon I looked up and there's waves on the pool at the Beverly Hills Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is glistening, and I said, "Excuse me, I got to go to the bathroom." And I went home. <laughs> and I said, "Whoa, no, no, that's not where I belong." <laughs> you know, I don't, want, I don't want to do, I don't really want to work with groups. And so I had uh, two choices to make at that time. I'd been given it thought. Seattle was a long way off; I had a little action. The governor of New Mexico offered to build a studio for me in New Mexico in a couple of places, da, 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 da. but it'd be just me in the studio would be there. Uh, and there's Nashville. And I had always gone to Nashville a lot to hunt songs. Dean loved the country songs, and I loved going down there for songs. And so I had I had some fear in Nashville at the time. Uh, so it was uh, pretty easy for me to... It, it took probably two months for me to find it aside, but it really was kind of, that's where you belong. Pop music was starting to be made with a drummer one day and the bass the next day and this and this and this. I love live recording. That's still going on in, in Nashville at the time. So uh, I decided that's what I'm going to do. I packed up a big uh, U-Haul truck and I went to Arkansas for a year. You don't, back then at least, you didn't burst into Nashville. Uh, if you did, you were a carpetbagger. Yeah, I wanted to ease in there gently. And I knew so many people. They were always so kind to me. I was on the CMA Country Music Association Board of Directors when I was running MGM Records. So I, I had a feel of the place, but I, I, I needed to clear out what I'd been doing and what I was going to do down there. So I spent that year based in Arkansas, yeah, driving around that southeast, going these in these bars. Uh, there'd be a thousand people in there dancing in a circle the country music they weren't buying it but they sure danced to it and country radio stations were starting to increase the amount from 300 to 400 to 500 growing and growing so it became apparent to me the problem the reason they didn't sell records was they didn't make albums they put out albums but they didn't make albums their mentality was a hit single uh the, the big money thing down there was publishing uh, not profit in the record companies They'd have a crossover every now and then, but just they they hadn't they didn't have a platinum selling album until the Outlaws album with Tom Paul Glazer and Waylon and Willie and Jesse. So they just went into albums. And they were spending ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars on an album. We were spending one fifty to two hundred. 
in, in the pop world. Well, you're trying to get in the same marketplace. You can see the, the product, product is not up to par for its competition in the store. Uh, and, and radio records weren't selling albums. So it became apparent to me that that's the place for me to go. It can't, the, anything could be done with music. Uh, the budget had to get bigger. The, the album needs to be a 40 minute show. It needs to open peaks and valleys, just like a show and, have, and close nicely. So you want to hear it again. And how it has to be thought out more in how it's programmed. And not after you've got the song, let's see which goes where. <laughs> before before you ever get to the studio, make sure you've got some stuff for radio. But I used to call them pieces of business, like in a show. So you, you want to hear that great big 30, 40 minute piece of music, not a two and a half, three minute piece of music only. And it was just now, okay, how do you get that accomplished? And that, that, that took a couple of years, but the people were, the artists were ready for it. The songwriters were ready for it. Everybody was ready for it. It just had to be, had to be done. Uh, and you, you, I grabbed the first few, I, my home in Nashville became John Paul Glazer's studios. Uh, even after I, I, moved, I came up there, I just got an apartment and I stayed, I stayed mostly in Tom Paul studios and he, he had a couple offices there. He said, hey, uh, take that office. And we were in his office. I said, I like this one. <laughs> he said, well, then we'll share it. And for a year, this man taught me the history of He'd been there all his life. The history of country music. He'd show me what a steel guitar. I didn't know how to record a steel guitar. He showed me how to. I used 20, 20 violins. He That world had two fiddles sometimes. So I had to learn how to. Make, how to make it sound. I started doing my own engineering side, which I had the great ones to learn from. So it was pretty easy for me to get into that world. And at the end of a year, Tom Paul had taught me not only the history of country music that I didn't know, history of Nashville, of the structure of the CMA, who's the power people, who's progressive, who's not, who's what and what. Uh, and then I was ready to then step in and put in action what I thought had to be done through country music. What would you say was the greatest raw talent that you witnessed or that you saw in Nashville? The greatest raw talent? Hmm. God, I don't know. I never, I never think of it. And, and I guess the biggest, the, the wildest one for me, just raw talent. I forget my... I had done Tom Brash and had some country radio hits, and, uh, but down when I got down there, Tom Mel Tillis and I become friends. Whenever I was running MGM, he was, he was an MGM artist. So when I get down there, I run into Mel. Hey, Bobo, why don't you make me a, a, a some records? I love being around him because he, he had the stutter down to absolute perfection. <laughs> so Mel and I, 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 I started doing the process with Mel. The first album I did with Mel cost 37500 He was normally spending 10 or 12 He called me over to his office, to, and he, I walked in, and he had this big desk with these bills all over it. And he, 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 when he get upset, he couldn't hardly talk at all. And he said, but boy, what, what? And he hollered, Maggie, his secretary, she came in, he said, tell, tell him what I, I want to know. <laughs> she said he wants to know how. What are all these bills? All this spend? Well, I'm on the couch. I'm laughing so damn hard. I wonder I didn't get fired, but he didn't. And I finally I said, Mel, your last album cost twelve. What did it sell? He said fifty thousand. I said, Well, we'll wait and see what this thirty-seven five does. Thank God it sold two hundred thousand. And he became Entertainer of the Year a year later, not because of me. He built up toward that, but he entertained the year, 200000 Oh, wait a minute, maybe spending that much isn't too bad. A little leak in the old way of doing it, a little, a little crack in the, in, the, in the wall. To your question, for me, I guess the biggest, neatest thing for me was Hank Williams Jr. And nobody liked Hank in Nashville in the business part. They used to make him record his dad's songs from, I think, age 10 or something. 
he was always do this, do this, do this, do this. You know, at some point, every artist wants to be who who they are. He got fed up and he went to Alabama. So when I took over Electra Records down there, I get a call from Mike Curve. Uh, do you are you interested in Hank Williams Jr.? I said, well, sure. And I go down to Muscle Shoals. I meet him. At, uh, we agreed to a meeting in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, a great little studio down there. I said to the guy, just have the rhythm section there for me, too, for a session. You never know. And I go down there and I meet Hank. I, I'd met him once before in L.A. How you doing, sir? Uh, uh, what songs did you bring me? That's what he had been used to out of Nashville. And I said, Hank? You're Hank Williams, Keenan. If you don't have any goddamn songs, I'm going back to Nashville. Uh, it's ridiculous. I'm not a publisher. I'm not a songwriter. I just thought, but you might have some, written some stuff your own self. And he looked at me like, whoa, well, come in here. Took me in this little room, picked up a guitar, played me family tradition. <laughs> Incredible song. I walked him across the hall. Oh, but lo and behold, there's a rhythm section, Hank. Let's just throw down it, throw this down. Well, he goes in. An hour later, we had the basic track for Family Tradition. He did a couple of vocals for me. I took it back to Nashville and worked on it some. And who he was and what he was was the biggest surprise to me down there because I had no idea. But when you hear a guy didn't want to, he leaves and he don't want to do music, he fell off a mountain and he killed himself. And all, but all that came together. I'm absolutely sure that I'm in charge of nothing in my life. It's, uh, I'm not a religious person, but somebody's in charge. All these pieces come together, and uh, he just had a great run there for about five years. And it was just him writing about him, his life, who he was. that had been trapped in there for years, and it just exploded. That was the uh, the neatest, greatest surprise of Nashville. And what was your first impression when you met George Strait? I was going to take over uh, MCA Records. Uh, I, at that, my story in Nashville is kind of like a book somebody would have written. I'd been a lector and then warned about was I'm about to take over MCA, but Irving Azoff at MCA in Mo Austin at Warner's, it took him a couple, three months to negotiate me out of one contract so I could go over to MCA. And George's manager was head of promotion at MCA. But obviously you can't have a, an artist you're going to really go after and have their manager be the head of promotion of all, all the artists. That, that's a problem built to, it's, into itself. So I asked Irving Wilson to come talk to me about that. Now, I hadn't taken over yet, but I'm a month away, probably. And I told him, I said, in about a month, I'm going to take over the label. You can't be there to promotion. I said, but you got this kid that's starting to do pretty good. We, just, we need to get together and, and talk. And <laughs> Jim Vogelsong, who was a, a nice man down there, he was running MCA at the time. He always said, I just don't know how Bowen five people working for me. <laughs> He's at another label. But it's that... It was all piece of stuff that was supposed to happen. I didn't fire his head of promotion, but you can't do both. Now I meet with George and Irv, and uh, I liked Irv right off. And George comes in, and now there he, he so reminded me of Dean Martin of that world. Dean wasn't care about stardom; he wasn't into all that stuff. Neither is George. And neither is George Strait. He's George had gone through his life. He, he got to this point, tell him, here's who I am, I want to sing, and was already headed toward really getting it happening. He just, it just wasn't being handled in the marketplace, nor were the albums, albums. They were a collection of songs, that, and he'd already sold a couple hundred thousand of the second album, but that seemed to be the, the end of the album. And I, and I met with George and I explained to him, hey, it's got to be your stuff. It's got to be you, the whole the way I believe recording and how I can help you and so forth. And I, and I said, if you do this, I'm going to tell you, you're going to, be, you're going to sell millions of records. The first thing we did was, uh, does Fort Worth ever cross your mind? And I, I found that in the bar at three in the morning. 
oh god the writer skips me at the moment uh but and i just kind of had it i always kept good song files and i had it that song file so i said here's something you could listen to but i said george I, everybody i help i have someone who'll take you to every writer and every publisher in this town or they'll come to you but i want you to pick the song i want you to tell me what you want to say i can't hand you who you are you got to say to me and, and he like all the 25 or 30 songs i said you find the 25 you love come in we'll listen to them and we'll figure out what's radio we'll figure out what makes a great album and I gave him that whole way I thought it should be done. And he's, uh, you knew right away you had somebody who had his ego in control. Uh, with artists, uh, all of us have that thing, you know. And after that, Al, probably 45 minute meeting the first time, when I got ready for to, go, to take over MCA and the, the first meeting over MCA, and I did this at any label if it was there, I said, all right. You have this, 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 and this. This one is our first one to go after because he's got everything, the look. He's, he's got the sound, and uh, he'll, he'll work at it. He'll really want it. And he did all that. Look how many records that man has sold over the years. After I left, Tony Brown just picked it up, and Tony and George just went right on with it, you know. Well, tell us a little bit about this producer, Tony Brown, who he was a guest on this show, and he talked so much about the influence that you had made in his life. So what do you think of Tony Brown? Well, the first time I met Tony, it was like a little industry thing or something, but I liked him. He was a cute, cute little fella. He was a, a musician, so I hit it off with him right away. And I talked to some musicians that he was working with over at RCA as a producer. And they'd say, you know, Bo, and he's, he's, he's kind of like you. He's it's not his thing. He, he, he knows it's the artist thing. And he helps us work in the studio good and all. And he made a couple of records I liked. And when I, when I did the MCA thing, I, I wanted somebody to be the a young head of the A&R, somebody to take the next step. And Tony was it. And they were, oh, you'll never get Tony, you'll never get Tony. It took about a 15-minute meeting, I think. Well, I think he knew, I knew, I had looked at him. I knew who I was going after. And then when I got to know him personally, and it didn't take five, ten minutes to know somebody personally in music. And then I warned him. And uh, I forget how the thing all, all went down for sure, but I knew I was going to get him, and I, and I knew he was coming over. And I explained to him how I thought production should be, how sessions should be run all the way I do it. And I said, I'm looking for somebody to do what I'm doing. What I'm doing is working. I want some other people to do it. I said, well, co-produce two or three projects together. And then you'll take what you like or learn from me, plus what you have, and, and uh, we'll have a hell of a label, two of us doing the same thing. And that's the way the whole thing fell down. We had a couple of fun that we had Buffett. We did a thing together with Jimmy Buffett. That was great fun. Uh, but he was to me, not the, not the executive thing. He was to me the next, uh, on the same track that I was musically for that genre. And it proved he, he was quite good at it. You mentioned Jimmy Buffett just a moment ago, and I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about the album you produced for Jimmy Buffett, Riddles in the Sand. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you produce Buffett, it's pretty much like he, he's an author. He, he writes it and you read it. Uh, and the same thing with his music. Jimmy knew his song, he knew how he was going to do it, and we used his guys uh, for the most part because they, they all knew just what to do. So much of the work you have sometimes with brand new artists, it's already been done when you get to a Jimmy Buffett. And uh, it was just a great experience. I remember Tony Abel, when the steel, when the drum, the steel drummer guy came in, you know, setting up the stuff. And I looked at the, uh, I had always had some engineers with me. And I looked at them, looked at Tony. I said, 
I've never, I've never mic'd that. I wonder how you mic that. <laughs> and Tony says, Tony says, I don't know. So I, so I walked out and I said to the guy, the, the musician, I said, you know, we don't have any idea how to mic your drums. Tell us. Well, he said, here's how you do it. <laughs> he hmm. called, showed, showed us in five minutes, you know. Uh, it, it's one of those unique experiences you have in life that doesn't matter if it's so one or it doesn't matter. It was just a neat thing for Tony, for me, for, and, and Jimmy really enjoyed it, too. He told me later he really did. What do you suppose is the secret to Buffett's success? Because he's just one of those artists It's just, wow, you know, just always draws a crowd, no matter what. Buffett, Buffett uh, his music was important, but Buffett was the key to Buffett. Uh, his lifestyle, his character, the personality. Buffett's shows were a party. They weren't concerts that you sat and listened to, you were a part of. Everything, years ago, out in, in, years before that in Hollywood, there'd be two or three little bars and nightclubs, restaurants, whatever they were, that would each have a singer like Tony Lopez or somebody else that had that magic in that little area. Buffett had it for the masses in all these different ways. If you're around the man for 30 minutes, you realize why he was so popular. But I never considered Jimmy Buffett a star. He was just an incredible person, entertainer, entity. And he had a great, I always got the sense Jimmy loved his life. He had a great time with everything he was doing. And Tony and I talked about, he agreed with that too, I think. Around the same time you started producing Reba McIntyre, what do you think about her as a recording artist? Again, she was on MCA, and uh, Irving Azoff called me a couple weeks before I was moving over there and said, uh, I'm, signing, I'm signing this kid, Reba McIntyre. How's that sound to you? I said, I bet, fine. I know who she was. I did not know her. So when I get there, I meet Reba, and I explain to her, oh, I she was, she had a very strong manager, a very strong boat riding husband. And she was kind of being, she was the old fashioned woman in the deal. She didn't have a checking account. She did, her own checking account. She didn't, she was being handled wrong, in my opinion. Not that I, I didn't like to tell her that and didn't. I went to see her work on stage live. You always go see them work live before you help them because the best part of helping them. And I see on stage, and there ain't no male domination in her life. She's in charge. And it, it was just obvious, being, well, let's put her in charge of her music, like you, did, you try to do everybody. And when we put them in charge, you don't let them hang themselves. You put them in charge and you help them so she, they accomplish what they want. And I meet with her, and I explain all this to her. And I ask, it's got to be your music. And I took her in. We got the basic track done the first time we recorded on a couple songs. She said, well, now, what are you going to put on this? I said, no, no, what do you want on it? It's your record. It's your music. You got to go out and perform this. Well, that little old lady, she walked right around, took my chair to the board. <laughs> took my chair <laughs> and started doing the overdubbing suite. It was great. It was so great. And that's the way we work. That's the, that's the way uh the way we did it. She's a neat, neat, neat uh, human being. And we tried, when I had this guy named Don Lanier. He was my buddy I grew up with. He was the guitar player in our band in the 50s. Our, not just a guitar player, but that was his instrument. And when he, by the time we get to Nashville, I hired him to be my uh, director of A&R. His job is songs. His job was to take all the artists, all the publishers and songwriters, find them songs, find them songs. Then we'd bring them back, and he and the artists and I would have a meeting and pare it down to so many songs. She loved that. She loved going and listening to songs. She loved that his nickname was Dirt. She loved working with Dirt and doing her songs. You, when that whole vibe starts to happen, any time I was starting to start to happen, it had great results. The, the key, one of the keys to her success was a song called Whoever's in New England. 
it was the first thing she did that was, it wasn't absolutely old-fashioned country, modern times. It was a, a, a little more modern even for her. She was a little concerned it was too popular. So uh, Dirt and I said, well, you know what? We'll make it last on the session. We get there, we'll try it, and we'll see what happens. And we had like 25 minutes left. So she thought we were through. We went, no, no, remember this? Oh, yeah, yeah. So she goes out. We get the basic tracks. I always had the artist do it live, of course, if possible. And then a couple more times right after the track's made. That's as close to the first time as you can get. And so we got the track. She gave me a couple more vocals. And what I would do with those three vocals is make the best of. In case there's always a main vocal, usually the live. But if the pitch gets off someplace or timing, you can fix it from one or the other two. She leaves. I do all that. <laughs> and she, and I remember I got a call. Jimmy, I really liked it, what you did there. <laughs> I didn't do anything but capture it, you know. <laughs> and that happened for her. And once that happened, uh, she shared herself with the husband. I think the manager, <laughs> she took over. And that's that's why she her career was and is what it is. she did great the other night on the ACN. <laughs> It's just amazing. All of these artists that you've worked with, my goodness, they're they're just the biggest artists of all time. I mean, some of these, like Kenny Rogers, you know, he's retiring mm -hmm. now, but all of these yeah. artists, their their imprint on music has just been incredible. What is it like for you when you think about all of these people collectively? You know, you I rarely do think about it. Uh, I, I get calls sometimes asking questions about a specific album somewhere in time, and I think I, I think I worked on maybe two hundred and fifty, three hundred albums. So sometimes, I, if it's a question that was key to the whole relationship, I'll remember it. But so much you don't remember because the, the way I worked my head was into the whoever at the time I was working with. I, my wife downstairs in our, she calls it our playroom downstairs. She has all these things up on the wall, pictures with different artists and different times, you know, from the fifties up to when I quit. And sometimes I, I, I go down into my exercise room and I'll, I'll walk the, every now, maybe every three or four months, I walk the room. It's just amazing. I walk in and go, damn. <laughs> I'm like a guy just walked in and says, wow, look at all that stuff on the wall. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but Bing, Bing, Bing Crosby, damn. Frank, Dean, and then the Nashville stuff. I had such a great time in Nashville. I loved Waylon Jennings. I got to I got to do some stuff with Waylon. Tom Paul, who I loved. I, I love Tom Paul. There's so many of them, so many of the people. I think... What's made retirement so neat for me? One, there is a lot of pressure when you're helping somebody. It's like being a doctor, you don't want them to die. You want them, music can be the key to a person's life. That's what they do. Uh, that, that to walk around and look at all that later, it's like, ha, oh, man, that's, I'll be damned. Then I go out and shoot 90 on the golf course. And then I'm not happy with me. <laughs> I told wife when they, I'm going to quit walking around looking into those before I play golf because my mind can't get back on golf. I'll look at a picture of, of somebody on the wall and go, oh, yeah, and remember things that happened during that piece of my life, you know. But every now and then, I, Tony Brown and I get to talk. Uh, that's, that's like a great lecture to me. Occasionally, I run into an artist or I'll speak with an artist. And it's, it's I look back at my life Almost every time, if I seriously look back at it, and I'm just amazed. I have no idea how all that happened. Uh, very little of it was planned. Uh, it just happened. And I think the key in life, too, especially in music, you got to roll with it. Don't try to don't try to stop it. Don't try to move it anywhere. You jump on and ride. So I, I did a book Paul a few years ago. And during that, when it, when it was finished, it was the editor called me from New York. 
And he said, you know, we didn't want war and peace. It was 460 pages long. Well, I never wrote a book. I didn't know. <laughs> and I got a guy to come help me after about a year and that does that for a living. And I said, you know what, pal? I said, you got the book. I got your money. Do what you want to with it. By then, I was in Maui. <laughs> I quit. And they cut it down to like 189, 190 pages. I never read it, uh, the little book. And they, had, they, of course, had the big one. Well, I had the 50s, I had the 60s, and then I had Nashville. Those areas were like careers unto themselves, you know. And, of course, I had way too much. They didn't like some of the Sinatra stuff, stuff about mafia. And, but I called I call somebody a real a real a-hole. And they called me and said, we can't leave that in there. We could get sued. I said, oh, no, I can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, naive, you know. What is the best thing about being Jimmy Bowen? Uh, the best thing? Mm. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I consider myself incredibly fortunate. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely sure somebody's in charge. And I think the reason I I had so much fun, so much success, is I I was so lucky to work with these creative people, and it was all a good time. Uh, rarely were there, were there negative actions with them. The bad times, the only bad times they ever had is if you have to drop an artist or report it's not selling or the negative part of our world. But basically, I don't think anybody's been, had more luck and good fortune that I have. It's just to work with these creative people. <laughs> well, as we're wrapping up here, I always like to give whoever the, the guest is the microphone just to directly address the audience. Whatever you want to say, completely open-ended to anyone who's listening. Hmm. Well... I remember in the 50s when I we were on stage, uh, the key thing you wanted when you're on stage is to please that 500 or 2,000 or whatever it was. Sometimes with me, it was 550 or 60. But you, your job, your thing was, as a person, is, is to make them glad they came, glad they're there. And with music, it was always great. It's great for me when people come up and say, oh, I love that record. I love this one. Or I love that piece of music you worked on. Those, those things are, I don't know, it's so satisfying. When that, when, it's like, I think anybody that does something, if you, if you build a house and the buyer loves it, if you do a painting and the world loves it, you, you get, it's such a fortunate thing. You get to walk away the rest of that day. One person, one little comment makes your whole day. Uh, and that's, I, I, I didn't, when I'm helping an artist do their music, part of my job is that we're aiming toward those people and we want them to like it. We want them to say, it. I want to see the artist win and get to go on and show everybody what they got and how good they are. And every time I go see an artist work and the crowd stands up, the enjoyment, the, the incredible feeling inside you is, uh, I don't know anything else except music. And I'm sure it happens to many, many people get to work in whatever they do. But I've always, it was, it was always like, without the songwriter, you don't have music. Uh, the composer, if there's no lyric. And without the audience, you're making music for each other. And obviously, uh, the fact that we were able to reach in a 30 some odd year period uh, that, that, that many millions of people with stuff they enjoyed. Uh, and I, I get it back all over I go all my life. I'm in Colorado. Hey, oh, you did that. I met my wife whenever that came out. And that, when you hear stuff like that, it just makes you feel like you did something good. And I don't know how you'd be appreciative to those people, but all of us who do that, 
really, really are. Mr. Bowen, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. And uh, I liked, I got to hear what you did, the interview you did with, with Tony, Tony Brown, and uh, that made me very proud. That made me feel good. <laughs> made my day. So it's like having, I guess maybe it's like uh, having family members do well. <laughs> you know, the guys you get to, that you work with, uh, every time every time I see something Tony did that came out good, it kind of made me feel good that he helped somebody. So I appreciate you calling, and uh, uh, if I go back to work, I'll call you. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate it very much, and thank you for the kind words. Thanks. Until next time.